Right, as we get started, I want to begin with some practical matters. So I'd like you to take your green sheet out of your bulletin, and I'd like to go over it with you very quickly before we get into the message from God's Word this morning. Next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday, say it, next Sunday. is Get Out of Church Sunday. And so it's going to be a little different here next Sunday next Sunday okay uh, you'll see some reasons again why we're doing this these are just some of the reasons there's many more uh, but you can look over them and see uh, there are still plenty of places to sign up so please after the service if you have not signed up for one of the projects go ahead and sign up I'll be behind the table if you have any questions I'll be there to explain it to you also, the shirts, notice, the shirts will be available. Uh, I, it says Jody's going to hand them out, but Jody signed up to do the fellowship today. So I'll be handing them out as well as helping you sign up. Uh, after um, you sign up, I just want you to know about the shirt sizes. Uh, I made an error uh, I'm usually the biggest person in the, in the room, but uh, so I only ordered up to extra large. So if you wear something above an extra large, like an eight times extra large or something, I don't know, and you can't fit into an extra large, then I would suggest you wear, if you have a mega sports camp shirt, wear that. If you don't, wear whatever. Just wear something you can get dirty. Okay, and you'll notice here, I have some nice jeans on. Next week, they won't be nice. They'll be old jeans because especially those of you who are staining down at the, um, down at the playground, you'll want to wear old clothes. Uh, let's see, anything else on that part? All right, on the back, uh, we could use your help. Uh, whether you're on one of the landscaping teams or not, if you have any of these tools at your house, if you would be willing to let us borrow them for next Sunday morning for the landscaping teams. We have four landscaping teams. Uh, we need all these things uh, that are listed on here. They're going to bring some, but I don't know if we'll have enough. So if you can bring some, as long as you have your initials or your name on it, so we can get it back to you when we come back to the church on Sunday. And then the schedule next Sunday. Meet here at 9 o'clock, okay? We'll have a brief service with a couple of songs, a commissioning prayer time, uh, some instructions, and then we'll break into our teams and we'll head out to our projects. And you'll see we'll do our projects from about 10 to 12. We'll come back here. We'll have lunch together in the fellowship hall. And then um, we'll have a worship service, our regular worship service in this room will be Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock and we'll run till 1.45, maybe 2 o'clock, uh, depending on how many testimonies we have. We'll have uh, regular worship, uh, praise and worship. We'll have a message, briefer, but uh, to the point. Um, and so I just want to encourage you with that. So that's all the practical things. Now today's message, first of all, let me just share a disclaimer. I didn't write this message. Uh, when, when we did this uh, project in our church, my former church about three or four years ago, uh, they had a series of sermons on the website for Get Out of Church Sunday, and so I preached all four. So what I did was I combined all four messages for today. But you will be amazed at how short it is. I promise. Four messages in 20 minutes. Well, uh, maybe 25. Okay. So uh, the, the other thing is uh, the verses are in the NIV. Now, I know that the Pew Bibles are NASB, and I tried to get NASB, but my computer at home only, for some reason, it only has NIV, uh, so I can only get NIV verses. So if, if the wording's a little different, uh, I just want to encourage you to follow along. All right, I want to just have a quick word of prayer and then uh, get into our 20-minute message maybe 25. Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to look in your word uh, to uh, get a bit of a different perspective on um, church, um, on what it is, on what you call us to do and to be. 
And we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now this message is not just about get out of church Sunday. This message is about living a life of faith. And so I want to start with the importance of parables. Have you ever asked yourself this question, why did Jesus tell the parables that he did? We know why he told parables. He was trying to help us understand the principles he was teaching. He was trying to paint a picture in our minds for these principles, right? We know that's the purpose of a parable, but why did he choose the particular parables that he chose? Well, my contention is that he chose each and every parable carefully to illustrate a critical truth. And so the parables kind of show us what are the most important truths that Jesus taught. He he took those truths and he illustrated them with parables. And so we're going to look at two parables this morning that illustrate two of the most important truths that Jesus taught us in the entire New Testament, in the entire Gospels. Uh, we have two parables we're going to look at. We have three pictures because one of the parables has two parts to it. And then we have two critical kingdom truths that he is illustrating with these parables that have to do with living a life of faith which is connected to get out of church Sunday. So let's look at these. Luke 13, 18 through 21. And again, this is uh, NIV. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Okay, so we have two pictures. The first is a mustard seed, the second is yeast. The mustard seed, as you know, as I'm sure you've heard if you've been in church for any length of time, is the smallest seed that farmers of that day in that area planted. Very, very tiny. You could hold 100 in your, in your palm very easily. And yet it grew into a bush that was 12 feet tall. That's like me standing on my head. That would be 12 feet. Two feet taller than a basketball uh, hoop. So that's a very big tree, so big and so wide that, the, as Jesus says, the birds would nest in its branches. In fact, it, it was, the mustard seed was a proverbial saying. You know, today we might say somebody has a pea brain. Hopefully you don't say that, but you know, some kids, kids still say that. In those days, they would say somebody has a mustard seed brain, literally, because it was known for its tiny size and yet the huge plant that it produced. The second picture that Jesus gives us in this parable is of yeast. And the important thing here is the amount of yeast. You see, Jesus as a boy would have watched his mother bake bread every day. And when they bo baked bread in those days, they didn't have... Uh, the little um, granules of yeast that we use today in a, buying a supermarket, they would take a little lump of the dough for that day and pull it out and set it aside. And then they would bake the bread. The next day, they would take that little lump and they would put it in the dough for that day's bread. And because it had been sitting out and got germs and stuff, it would cause that day's bread to rise. Now, the important thing here is the amount of yeast that Jesus mentions. Now, we don't see it in our Bibles, but in the original Greek, it says, Jesus says that there were three satas of yeast. Or three, I'm sorry, three satas of bread. Take that little lump and put it in three satas of bread. Now, that was about 50 pounds of, of bread or dough that they were putting that little piece of yeast, probably about as big as a marble into 50 pounds of dough, and it would cause that dough to rise. 
Now Jesus was exaggerating here because nobody in those days had an oven that was big enough to cook 50 pounds of, of, of to put 50 pounds of dough into it. That's, you, you, you guys who cook, you know that's a, lot, <laughs> that's a lot of dough. So Jesus was exaggerating the, to make a point. And what point was it? You see, Jesus in this parable was not talking about horticulture or baking. He was talking about one of the most important, critical kingdom principles that we can live by. And that is this. In spiritual things, when it comes to spiritual things, God uses small things to do big stuff. Right? God uses small things. Now in our society, we look for the big. But in God's economy, he looks for the small to do big things because then he gets the glory. I mean, we see this all through the Bible, don't we? When God wanted to plant a new nation, he didn't, he didn't choose a huge family, but he chose a nomadic man and woman, Abraham and Sarah, to start with. When God wanted somebody to lead his people out of slavery, he didn't choose some hero of the day. He chose a man who had been rejected by his own people, the Egyptians, and had spent the, most of his productive years as a lowly shepherd. When God wanted a king to lead his people, again, he chose a lowly shepherd boy, a small thing, to do great results. When Jesus wanted to feed the 5,000, he didn't go to a baker or a butcher. He went to a little boy who had a little lunch and produced great results. When Jesus was watching people give in the, in the synagogue, he wasn't impressed by people that gave hundreds or thousands of dollars. What impressed Jesus? The widow who gave a penny. Little things, big results. And most importantly, when Jesus came to earth, he didn't come in a rich family, in a notable family. He was born to a, a, a poor, unknown couple. So all through the Bible, we see this truth illustrated for us in almost every story we read. When it comes to spiritual things, God uses small things to do big stuff. And the reason this is so important, next week, <clears throat> next week, uh, <laughs> See, I'm so young, I'm still going through puberty. You didn't know that, did you? Um, <laughs> next week, next week, uh, when we do get out of church Sunday, you know, raking leaves, cutting some shrubs, that's not a big thing. But you know what? Because you're doing it in faith, because you're doing it to honor Christ, God is going to produce great results next week we saw it in our church I've read testimonies from churches all around the country that have done this and just seen unbelievable results and I really believe it's going to happen here next week small things big results well there's another truth another parable that I want to share with you that illustrates another critical kingdom truth and I'm just going to share this one outright and then talk about it a little bit oh I'm sorry I skipped something here 1 Corinthians 27, um, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. This is another way of saying God uses the small things to produce big results. He chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast. Just another way of stating that principle. In spiritual realms, God uses small things to do big stuff. I love this quote by Mother Teresa. She says, we can do no great things as people, as, even as Christians. We can do no great things, only small things with great love. We can do no great things, only small things with great love. And that's what we're doing next week. We're not doing something great. Going out raking leaves is not something, you know, that's going to be on the 6 o'clock news. But we do this with, with 
<clears throat> love and God produces the results that we would never expect. Okay, so let's, I'm so excited. Let's move on to the second one. Second, second truth is this. When it comes to spiritual things, God often uses the detours in our lives to produce results. Isn't that true? Haven't you found that to be true just in general? You're going, well, you like life to be going like this and just nice and smooth, but you know how it is. You have a trial, you have a tragedy, you have a, a problem, and, and you have all these detours, but it's in the detours where God works the most in our lives. How, let me just ask you this. How, how do you feel when you're driving along and you see a detour sign? <laughs> You don't go, hey, great, I get to take a detour, right? Anybody do that? Let me see your hands. <laughs> no. You go, oh, you know, you're anxious because you don't know where this thing's going to go. And you're frustrated because you don't know how long it's going to take and it's probably going to make you late. I just, I was picking up Jody Thursday from something and, and you know, I was right on time. I was going to be there right on a button, maybe a minute late, but I was cruising along. All of a sudden I see a sign for a detour. My immediate thought, oh, no, I'm going to be late. She's going to be upset. Oh, this is not good. Fortunately, the detour happened after my next turn, so I, I escaped that. But, but that's the normal response, right, to a detour. But you see, in spiritual things, God sets up detours in our lives because that's when he uses us. And that's when he, we see the results. Now let me ask you this question. What if you're driving along and you see two signs? One says, detour ahead, and the other sign says, take your usual route. Which one would you choose? Anybody choose the detour? No, no, you don't, do you? Well, next week, we're going to take a detour. We're going to do something a little different. And you may be a little anxious because you don't know what's going to happen exactly. And you may be a little frustrated because it's not the usual time when you come to church and go home. But you see, God uses the detours. And we're going to look at a parable that talks about how he uses the detours to minister to others and to use us to do that. Now some detours are not our choice. Sometimes we have detours in our lives, you know, illnesses, layoffs, things like that. that that's not our choice. But other detours are. Sometimes we get to choose to take a detour to help someone. Let me give you some biblical examples. Some people who had detours that weren't their choices. Joseph wasn't his choice to get thrown in a pit, to get taken down to Egypt, to get thrown in jail. But God put that detour in his life for a reason, didn't he? And he produced some pretty great results from that detour in Joseph's life. Jacob, his father, he had to take a detour down to Egypt when the famine was in the land. Samuel, the prophet Samuel, you know, he his mother gave him to the synagogue. That was a detour in his life. He had to leave his mother and go to the synagogue when he was very young. But God used that to produce the greatest prophet of early Israel. So those were some details that they didn't choose. But again, the principle that God uses the details and detours in our lives to produce great results. Others chose to take detours. Jesus he chose to go out and be tempted in the wilderness, didn't he? But it was that detour. After that, he, was, he came back and began to minister and heal and, and start his way to the cross. Peter. Jesus called Peter to take a big detour, did he? To go from a fisher of fishing to a fisher of men. But look what that produced in his life and in the world. Paul. Paul was persecuting Christians on the road to Damascus. Jesus called him to take a detour and look at the results in his life, in the lives of those around him, in our lives, even thousands of years later. God uses the details. So let's get specific. Let's see how God uses the details in one of the parables that he tells to illustrate this point. We're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. I know it's very familiar to you, but I want to share a couple things that might be a little bit different perspective. Maybe you haven't heard this before, but uh, first of all, I want to read uh, Luke chapter 10, 
verses 25 through 29, and I want you to think about the reasons that Jesus tells this parable. Okay? On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus says. Now hear this. Go and do it. Go and do it. You see, there were two reasons Jesus... Oh, and then, and, well... Okay, I'm sorry, I missed it. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Okay, so there's the, there, now Jesus is going to tell the parable. But the reason he tells it is twofold. There's two reasons. One, the lawyer, it's a scribe, or in those days a lawyer, he was an expert in knowing. That's why he knew that, that truth. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. He was, he was right, he knew it. But see, it's not enough to know. You have to know and do. God calls us not just to know his word, but to do his word, doesn't he? And then in verse 28, and then in verse 29, here's the other reason Jesus told the parable. The lawyer was trying to, it says right here, the lawyer was trying to justify himself, to make an excuse, to say, who is my neighbor? You see, in those days, uh, in, in Jewish culture, the neighbor was considered somebody who was of your own race and religion. So normally, when somebody would say, help your neighbor, that would mean help, help somebody who is in your city and Jewish. And anybody else, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. They're not your neighbor. And the lawyer was trying to use that to get out of helping people. And so Jesus tells the parable. Let's look at it. Starting in verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he took, put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense that you may have. You see, this detour took two things for for, the, for this guy. It took time or personal involvement and it took time, right? He had to get personally involved. He had to get down in the ditch with this guy where he'd been beaten up. He had to physically touch him in order to bandage him, in order to pick him up and put him on his donkey. So he had to get personally involved. He couldn't call 911. He couldn't just call his pastor. He couldn't just send a check. He had to actually get physically involved in order to help. And then it took time. You know, he was on his way somewhere. Might have been somewhere important. And yet, he took time to, to, to get down there and bandage him and, and fix him up and put him on the donkey. And so he, he was probably late for wherever he was going. But he was willing to do that in order to help his neighbor. You see, this detour that the Samaritan took, it took looking past excuses. He could have been like the Levite. He could have been like the, other, the priest, said, well, you know, that's not my problem. But he wasn't. He didn't, he didn't make excuses. He said, there's somebody that I can help, I'm going to help him. Because that's what God calls me to do. That's what the Christian faith calls me to live out. This detour is known as the epitome of loving your neighbor. When we think about loving your neighbor, what do we think about? The Good Samaritan. Because that's what he did because he had personal involvement and he took the time to help his neighbor. He showed love. He acted on what Jesus taught us to do. 
And so that, that shows us that the greatest ability that we have to help others is not a degree, is not Bible knowledge, is not scripture mem- how many scriptures we've memorized. The greatest ability that each of us has to help others is our availability. Are we available to get personally involved and to take some time to help others as Jesus calls us to do? And so did Jesus answer his questions? Who is my neighbor? Well, yes, he did. Your neighbor is anyone in need that you can help. But he did more than answer the questions. Here's, here's the really interesting part. They're really kind of, I find a little even humorous. 36 and 37. Which of these three, he asked, Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert on the law, the lawyer replied, well, the one who had mercy on him, the one who helped him. Now, Jesus didn't leave it at that, did he? He could have just walked away. He said, you're right. He says, you, go and do likewise. He calls us to love our neighbors, but not just praying for them, not just saying we love them, helping them when we can. One of his disciples, John, when he wrote uh, the epistle of 1 John, uh, I think he may have had this story in mind when he wrote this verse. When he says, Dear children, let us not love with words or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. I want to challenge you this morning. Next week, let's take a divine detour together. Next week, let's take action. Next week, let's get out of the church and love our neighbors in deed and in truth. Like I said, I'll be out there for you to sign up. I'll be out there for you to get your shirts And I hope all of you will be able to join us next week because it's going to be awesome. And next week, I just want to give you a preview. Next week, after lunch, when we worship, the message I'm going to share comes right from the Scripture, right from Jesus' own words, and it's going to tell us the impact that we've made, and it's going to tell us how much joy we have brought the Father. So you don't want to miss that. You could come just for the message. But come for the, come for the get out of church Sunday at 9 a.m., right? When is it? All right, amen. <laughs>